Paul Smeltzer, our own Rotarian, is an arborist representative with Bartlett Tree Experts. And he will tell you what to do if you spot any of these invasive little buggers in your neighborhood. Um, <clears throat> there's also a video that was posted on the Observer that you can watch and uh, gives you a little bit of background as well. Um, but Paul's love of the outdoors and horticulture led him to Bartlett's after college at Newman University. He is a certified arborist with the International Society of Arbor Culture. <clears throat> Paul is uh, very proud of obtaining the rank of Eagle Scout and is also still very active in scouting. Uh, in his free time, he enjoys cycling, camping, fishing, and gardening. <clears throat> and he is proud father to Paul Jr. and Emmett and loves spending time with them and his wife, Rebecca. So Paul, we'll turn it over to you. Um, take yourself off mute. And if you have a presentation, you can share your screen. All right, yep. Uh, thank you, Scott. Thank you for that introduction. I do have a presentation. I'm going to try to get it queued up here. I assume everybody has heard about spotted lanternfly a little bit. Uh, and we're going to talk about it a little bit more. So it is a pretty bad invasive pest, has been slowly becoming more active in our area. And, you know, there are some concerns with it. So why should we care about it? So largely we do have some agricultural damage. This pest in general is attacking a wide range of host plants when it comes to agriculture, including plums, cherries, peaches, nectarines, avocado, or excuse me, apricots, almonds, apples, hops, grapes. So if you like your hard ciders, your beer, and your wine, this one's coming at you pretty hard. Um, it's going to increase pesticide use on those agricultural crops. That is a big concern for a lot of people, including even our organic uh, grown crops are gonna see more increased use of those organic pesticides to keep this guy under control. You know, the Pennsylvania economy could be drained about 30, or 324 million annually is an estimation that's been put out by Penn State. And that's a lot, a, a large amount. I could not find any information on what New Jersey was expecting here. Um, we also have a big impact to the quality of our life, impact to our ornamental trees, and an impact to our public health and safety. So, you know, spotted lanternfly, a little bit about the pest itself, native range, China, India, and into Vietnam. It's actually a plant hopper. So it gets the title lantern fly, but it's not a true fly. Um, so plant hoppers themselves are small bugs in general that we do experience naturally in our area, just not to this extreme. So the spotted lantern fly, why most leaf hoppers and plant hoppers are relatively small, this one is a pretty big bug. So it's very noticeable when it's an adult about an inch long, half inch wide. Um, front wings are gray with black spots. Uh, wing tips have a black blotchy pattern with a gray outline. The rear wings have black with a big red patch on them. This is probably the most significant feature that a lot of people pick up on as the pest lays with its wings outspread. You will pick up on that red patch very quickly. Um, but when the wings are closed, they're very well camouflaged and sit right up on the trunk of the tree. So right now, the invasion has started. So we have seen uh, this pest first started out in 2014 in Bucks County. So that's in Pennsylvania. So if you can see this little point, that's where we started out on the map. And we have moved outward ever since. Um, right now, we have started to see it in Pennsylvania, New York, New Jersey, Ohio, Connecticut, Maryland, Delaware, Virginia, and West Virginia. So we've seen this pest continue to move out and expand. Um, personally, we did start seeing it here in New Jersey, not last year, but the year before that, in very small numbers, mostly on towns closer towards the Delaware River. And this last summer was the year that it seemed to be much more prevalent, uh, seeing it all around and continuing to see egg masses this winter on a lot of different trees. 
um, has also been classified as an invasive pest in South Korea and Japan, where it has been doing damage to crops as well. So this is becoming a problem for more places. We expect it to continue to grow. So we want to try to slow that spread if we can. Um, so identification, here's just a picture of the adult, but we're gonna go through the stages. So this um, photo here on the right, is very widely used from Pennsylvania, uh, from Penn State being the big spearhead here on control of this pest. But this will list out and identify most of the stages we'll see this pest in. You know, eggs tend to over, are the overwintering stage. Early spring, we start to see the nymphs. There are two cycles with the nymphs. You can see them there on B and C. And then late summer, we start to see the adults become really evident. And that's when people start to really freak out and be really, really concerned. So we're gonna work through that, each of those cycles, and we're gonna show some pictures so we can see them and be better at identifying this problem. So eggs are typically laid in late summer and in the fall, you typically see about 30 to 50 eggs laid in rows horizontally. Um, they're covered by the females with a gray-brown mud-like covering. When it first gets laid on, it has a very sort of smooth, lacquery sort of appearance. But as it ages, it gets to have a con an appearance like cracked or dried Play-Doh is probably the best way to describe that. Um, they're commonly about an inch long, about a quarter inch wide. And they can be found on smooth bark trees, stones, farm equipment, yard equipment outside furniture, campers, vehicles, and any other soft surface. So this has been one of the biggest problems and we're gonna to touch base on that a little bit later. But um, they're also often laid on the, in or under protected areas. These are some of my photos that I've taken throughout the seasons. So I've seen them up in Burlington, Mount Laurel. Here you can see the covered egg masses laid on very thickly here on this maple with exposed eggs in those lateral row, rows that we were talking about here, here. Here's another picture of an egg mass, all, just one on a maple out in Mount Laurel. You can see the color is very similar and very close to the bark color. So it can be very hard to detect and pick up on. You know, there will be planted right at the bases of cut branches or over where branches have met the trunk of trees or on the undersides of branches where they're gonna be protected and out of the elements. I think we have just a couple. And sometimes they'll be planted where it's just one or two. And other times you'll have almost overlaying egg masses. So this can be pretty sometimes pretty obvious to see and other times it's pretty hard to find them and they can be laid from you know starting off right at the ground six foot right there in your face all the way up to the tops of these trees so they can be pretty hard to find but they're also laid on anything else it seems like so you can see here some photos this is a light bulb has an egg mask on it we have an old tire here hasn't been moved, egg mass is laid on it. You know, here I imagine if this was just a tire to a camper or a trailer that's been parked underneath a tree uh, in the fall, these eggs are gonna get laid on it or even the camper itself. And then it's gonna get moved in the summertime, taken down to the shore, parked there for the eggs to hatch. This is one of the biggest ways that this pest has started to really move around is being transported by us humans trying to do our daily lives. Here you have it being laid on um, patio furniture. This is gonna be an incredible nuisance for whoever's you know, couch this is. Here is a wooden shelf just laid out and a camp chair. So there you will take advantage of any of these surfaces to lay these eggs on. So after that egg stage, we start moving into the nymph stage. So these eggs, we expect to hatch out anywhere between April through October. I just got a report the other day, or actually, excuse me, earlier today about eggs hatching in Northern New Jersey. 
Um, so we expect to see egg hatching here uh, any day now. So we're gonna start to see more of these nymphs. When they first hatch out, they're a very small, um, quarter of an inch in size, black with white spots, very distinct. Um, as they move through their life stages, um, through the instar stages as the nymphs, they start to turn to a red color with a white spot. Um, very bright, very easy to see. Uh, and as soon as they start hatching, they start feeding on trees, crops, and vines by puncturing the stems and the stalks of the usually the younger tender growth because their mouth parts are not as well developed as the adult stage. Um, the fourth instar, which is the last instar before they turn into adult, ends up being about a half inch. So not terribly big, but they can do quite a bit of damage. The nymphs are wingless, so they're not flying. Their primary way of moving around is jumping, um, and they will do so if they're approached. Um, they also produce honeydew at a very alarming rate, very similar to aphids, but at a higher prolificity. Um, so here's some photos. Once again, first instar, we can see that black color with that white spot. Very noticeable, very unusual for this area to have anything else that will look or have this color pattern. Um, they will hatch out from the egg masses but in number, so you tend to have, or it's very rare to tend to have one or two in on a plant by itself. And you'll tend to have a whole bunch of them. So remember that these eggs are being laid 30 to 50 deep. Um, if you have multiple egg masses, you then have multiples of those numbers. So they can become, they can be pretty prolific when they hatch out. Uh, fourth instar, this is the last one before they start to turn into adults. This is when they start to develop that red color. So they replace some of that black on their skin for this red color on their exoskeleton, still remaining with those white spots. So some more photos of them feeding. This is the stalk of an Atlantis, one of their preferred host plants over in Cherry Hill. And then as we get into the summer, we start to see the adults. July into November, depending on when that first real freeze comes in and start moving them. We saw activity last year in November, almost into December because of the temperatures. We had that Indian summer where those temperatures stayed warmer. So um, this is when they do start to develop, um, excuse me, wings and they can fly. They are the greatest at flying and they're still prefer to hop and jump away. If you saw some last year and were knew what you were looking at and were trying to squish it, I'm sure you have been outwitted by them and they're jumping. They have very quick reflexes and you can get away from predators very quickly by jumping. Um, still heavily feeding on trees, crops, and vines, producing a lot of honeydew. That honeydew becomes an incredible problem for us. So that's the adult there. They tend to congregate on trees. This is a young maple, and you can see we got a good 30, 40 here congregating on this portion of the tree. So the other preferred host that we see this plant on, or this pest on is oaks, red maple, silver maple, river birch, walnut, willow, and styrax. So if we look at probably these first Four here, we can see that we kind of have a big problem. So a lot of the shade trees here in the Haddonfield area along the street, in our backyards, on our front porches, in front of our apartments, you know, tend to be in this group with the oaks, the red maples, the silver maples as well, and the river birches. So we will see a lot of that activity on these pests or on these plants by this pest. And this is going to be part of the problem as we get into the presentation a little bit later, what the feeding can do to these plants itself and what the feeding damage will cause for us itself. So we're going to touch base on that right now. 
So we have the spotted lanternfly feeding. So feeding uh, is by puncture into the phloem. So this pest has a proboscis. So this long structure right here on the underbelly extends from here down is, oh, is its mouth and over time through natural selection it has developed into this very long needle-like structure. Similar to a mosquito, similar to an aphid, and it's able to take this proboscis, stab it through the tree's bark into the phloem and ingest on the sugary saps and carbohydrates that flow up and down the tree in that area. It does not fully digest its food, so it excretes a very sugary excrement called honeydew. Um, very prolific green, to the point that when we have a heavy infested tree, we, you can stand underneath it and it'll seem like it's raining. That's how prolific these buggers can be. So on that, on that honeydew, we'll a lot of times see sooty mold grown. So this is a black mold. It is the number one way of identifying that you have a feeding problem from a sucking insect that will, that, excuse me, that could be spotted landfly. So if you start seeing this mold on your plants, underneath your trees, on your sidewalks, on your patio furniture, that is a good indication to have a tree looked at to identify if it's being fed on by spotted landfly. There are several other pests that will cause that problem. So we don't want to outrule those pests, but if we start seeing it, it's something we want to look for right away. Um, its feeding is reliant on the torgo pressure of the tree. So this is the internal pressure of the blood vessels of the tree. So as its mouth part goes into the tree, it's not actively sucking the juices out. It's relying on the tree to actually pump those nutrients and that sap through its body itself. Um, so this is why we'll see that a lot on the more higher or the trees that have a higher flow. For instance, we see a lot of pressure on the red maples, like I said, in the silver maples, but not as much pressure on Norway and Japanese maple. They're in the same genus. They just don't seem to have the same flow rates. So that's why we're seeing a lot less pressure on them. Um, the feeding itself here is more of a plant stressor. So this, this pest itself is not actively killing trees I would say mature trees in our area. It's not been observed by science, by the research. It, it's feeding is stressing our trees out to the point that something else, boring insects, disease, fungal infections are coming in, causing the decline in the death of the tree. Where we are seeing this pest actively kill um, plants is the tree of heaven itself, the smaller tree saplings that cannot overcome just the volume that this pest will put through, and grapevines. That's where the research has shown a lot of damage has caused. Vineyards out in the Pennsylvania area, vineyards here in New Jersey are going to have a tough time with this pest as it becomes more prevalent. I wanna also be clear that this pest does not harm people. It does not feed on people, pets. It does not cause damage to your houses. It's not going to chew up your siding, things like that. There's been a lot of um, bad press and maybe people trying to make the wrong advertisements that this is going to be a problem for you when it comes to that things. You know, people I've seen spraying their houses because they are concerned that this pest is going to do damage to their houses. The worst case that you'll get in that instance would be an egg mass laid on your house, spraying the house isn't gonna prevent that, and the egg masses can be scraped off or power washed off. So there are some people doing some unethical things in the industry when it comes to the scare factor that people are having with this pest. So I know Denise, you were very concerned, but hopefully that puts you a little bit at ease there with that. Um, so here's what we're seeing a lot, and this is the number one way that a lot of people will first know that they have a problem. If they don't see the pest outright, they start to see the sooty mold on the leaves, on their cars, on their patios, 
you know, complaining that they have to power wash their sidewalks, you know, all every all of those things will happen because of this sooty mold that we start to see and the honeydew on the undersides of the tree. You know, um, people will experience, especially in the midsummer to late summer, a lot of activity from stinging insects as well. So honeybees, yes, yellow jackets, wasps, hornets, all very well, or all very attracted to this sugary liquid. They're feeding off of it, trying to turn it into their stores to help them, you know, survive. This becomes a big problem for us as homeowners, as people that run businesses, having that dripping down on our property and having our, having to deal with that insect there that we don't want. We don't want our clientele to be stung by bees. We don't want our kids to be stung by bees or hornets, yellow jackets as well. So this becomes a big problem. Um, we don't want this stuff dripping down onto our cars, staining them, it becomes a very tough liquid to get off. Um, so this has been the biggest nuisance with this pest. And we can have some pictures here of this sooty mold staining this deck. You know, very dangerous situation here. We have steps going up and down. We have very slick substance now on the deck that A, we could slip on. B, now it's very hard to get rid of. C, now it's starting to cause discoloration of the pest or of the, of the deck itself. So this can be a problem. So when we start talking about management, so a lot of times we recommend our five steps for management here. So first off, we wanna to try to stop the spread. We wanna to try to keep this pest isolated as much as we can possible. We wanna scrape egg masses, number two. Number three, we wanna brand our trees to help catch nymphs. Number four, we, can, we wanna remove the primary host, tree of heaven, whenever we see it, whenever it's practical. And number five, we're looking at applying insecticides to help keep us under control. So first we wanna stop, you know, stop the spread. So how do we do that? So we wanna do things like not moving our firewood. And we wanna check our outdoor equipment for our egg masses, especially coming out of the winter months. You know, eggs are laid in the fall. They sit there all winter. If we have pieces of equipment that we wanna move, I think of things like trailers, boats, um, cars that have sit, you know, we're buying a car, moving a car, things like that. We wanna make sure that we don't have our egg masses on those and then we move in them to a different state or even to a different county where we haven't experienced this pest. If we do see or have to move that piece of equipment, that chair, that piece of firewood, whatever it ends up being, we wanna make sure that we scrape any egg masses that we see on it. We don't wanna park underneath these infested trees for the fact that this pest can be a very good hitchhiker. It'll find its way into the crevices of our cars, through an open window. We drive 10, 15, 20 minutes down the road. It's gonna get out, it's not gonna miss a beat, and then we have a new problem down the road. So that's how we wanna stop the spread. Next step, we wanna make sure that we're scraping our egg masses and smashing them if we're seeing them. So a lot of people ask about this. You know, so we can use any sort of plastic, metal material, scrape off these egg masses, you know, plastic debit card, you know, putty knives, knife, you know, butter knife themselves. They work really great at scraping these egg masses off. We want to scrape those eggs typically into a bag or a bottle, put some alcohol in with that, and that'll help to kill those eggs, throw and dispose of that bottle afterwards. Other recommendation is there is to smash the eggs with a hard, flat surface. You'll see those smashed eggs starting to burst. And you can kind of see that here in this photo, right here. So this is something that we should start doing in our winter months, even till now, because we still haven't seen egg hatching. So if you're looking for something to do to help this pest right now, it would be checking your trees, scraping the egg masses that you can reach. And please don't go climbing up your 40 foot tall, 50 foot tall maple to try to get egg masses. There's other ways to help with that, 
But if you have low-lying young maples, young oak trees, things like that, this is a perfect hobby to go do on a nice, nice day. You know, you use a little bit of vodka, that's the alcohol to kill them, you have a party, there you go. So next thing we wanna start doing is using traps to help catch spotted layer fly. So in the springtime, these are very effective. The nymphs themselves don't have wings, they're gonna get caught by this trap. As they fall off a tree or are moving to find a new tree, they're gonna climb right up the trunk. So this is where these sticky tapes and traps like this can be very effective. Why it is not as effective for the adults. So we can see here that the adults, you know, yes, we are catching some, but we got plenty of adults here that aren't being caught. And what's not shown in this picture is we also have adults higher up the stem that are not being, not being caught as well. It gets the point too with these that if we have enough trapped adults on the tape, the trap itself will just, or the adults themselves will just walk over the trapped comrades right up to the tops of the trees. So if you are going to use tapes and things like that, you need to change them pretty regularly. You know, we want to manage the tree of heaven. So removing tree of heaven, it's going to help reduce the spider lantern fly population. It's not going to eliminate them completely. But so positively identifying this plant, removing it when it's possible, getting it out of the area is going to be extremely helpful. The problem with removing this pest or this pest tree, this weed, is that when we remove them, they'll tend to sprout off the root plates themselves. So if the whole, you cut the tree down to a stump, you'll get sprouting off that trunk, you'll get sprouting off the root system that's left behind. It is a very tough plant. A lot of times we find that we have to treat this tree with a herbicide to kill off that root stem. Um, as we move into insecticidal controls, there's a lot of different ways to treat this pest. We ask that you rely on a professional to help you with these decisions. There are a lot of good ways to control it. There are a lot of bad ways that can be impactful on things like our beneficial insects. And there are ways that are just not gonna be effective. Certain products aren't gonna work on this pest. There are, depend, you know, depending on situations, I know some people are really opposed to the use of insecticides when it comes to killing things around their properties, and treating problems, pests. There are organic options and natural options to help control this. I would say that some of that does not work as effectively as some of the synthetics. So depending on your treatment program, you may be looking at more or less treatments for that. A lot of my treatments are relying on the, the systemics. They are very effective. They last a long time. We can get really good control over the nymphs and the adults with minimal impact on our beneficials. We are seeing beneficial or help with the beneficial insects. So promoting them on your properties are gonna help. You know, we have pictures here of assassin bugs, spiders, prey mantises all feeding on this pest. They're not gonna be able to keep up with this problem though. So, so that was my quick presentation. We glossed over some things. I know that we're probably getting close to our time too, but if we have any questions, I think I'm here for that. Um, what do people do if they start spotting, you know, in infestation on their, their neighborhood? Do they go to their local home, home improvement store and grab, you know, some of those, um, um, you know, sticky bands? Do they call somebody like you? What, what do you suggest that they do to, to deal with this? So if they're, if they're starting to see the problems on their trees themselves or the trees at their place of business, you know, that's where a local arborist or a pest control company can start to help. It needs to be a company that is labeled in the treatment of woody ornamentals. So some turf companies aren't gonna be able to help you. Some just exterminators aren't gonna be able to help you. They're not, they don't carry that sort of licensing. Um, once you do get in contact with a company like that, you can treat the pest. Treatment plans can be designed and followed through on. 
there are products that can be bought locally at a hardware store. It all depends on the active ingredient and the concentrate. Making sure that if you want to try to treat this yourself, that you check the label, read through it, and see if fire lanternfly or leaf hoppers are listed on the label. If they are not, the product is not effective for that pest, or it is illegal to spray that pesticide for that pest. Are those up insecticides um, safe for pets or not? So every pesticide could have its downsides. It's hard for me to just give you a yes or no answer on yeah. that. Sometimes it comes down to how the pesticide is um, applied. You know, sometimes a pesticide will be perfectly safe for you and your families once it's dry. So if it's a spray, you know, it may not be the best thing to be out there while the technician or you are doing spraying it yourself. You want to make sure you're covered up with proper PP. Once that pesticide's dry, it's perfectly fine to go re-enter that area, touch even the plant that it was sprayed on. Um, some pesticides like insecticidal soaps and horticultural oil, very um, low impact when it comes to contact on the, you know, the human skin. Um, so wouldn't recommend it. I'm not endorsing you, you know, go around touching it, but low impact, low risk there. So it all depends, Denise. It's tough, tough yes or no question there. Do you think that uh, the county uh, government would have any information about what they're doing to battle it? Any so idea? New Jersey itself has had a reporting website and to report what is, or if when you start seeing Spire and Lairfly, I don't know that website, a number off the top of my head, I can get that information out from the reports that I heard last year from talking with people and talking with clients is they were saying that that website was very overloaded. They were getting a lot of information. They started to really know once the quarantine was expanded out, which engulfs all the counties that, you know, Haddonfield was within the quarantine zone, that they had gotten to the point where like, we know it's there, we know. <laughs> so I'm not gonna say don't report it, don't do your due diligence, but to follow up on what the state is doing, I'm not aware what the state is doing for the average homeowner right now. They are concerned about their vineyards, they are concerned about areas where we start to see lots of transportation, you know, shipping containers, equipment coming in and out of, and that's where the state of New Jersey has really been focusing on. The homeowner themselves have kind of been left a little bit out there, so. Well, should we put those tapes on our trees if we can? If you can, I'd suggest it for the trees that are within the plant, you know, that we're seeing the pressure on. You know, I get yeah. a lot of questions about, should I just pick them? Should I just pick them? And I tell people, Take the trees that we're going to see the problem on. If you have a styrax, you have a river birch, you have an oak. Um, a lot of problems that I didn't touch base on is, you know, we, you know, those tapes are indiscriminate. They're going to catch your beneficial insects. They're going to catch your problem insects. They can even catch squirrels and birds if they're landing there on them. Ah, okay, okay, okay. So selecting the proper trees minimizes those risks. So that list that you gave us would be the ones that we would need to be those, paying attention those to. Those are the most common in this area. You know, the pest itself has been seen to be feeding off 80 plus different species of plants. So it can be a very wide range, but when it comes to the average homeowner, you know, those are the main trees we're gonna see it on. You know, some other ones that come to mind is, you know, you wanna make sure you're checking your roses, check your viburnums. Those are some other plants we're starting to see them on as well. Okay, thank you. Paul, thank you so much. I'm, I'm really, really glad we got it. And I'm glad we recorded this thing. Uh, so other, we can share this with other people and get the word out. I think it's pretty important. So thanks again. It was great to see you. I know you're seriously busy, but please join us whenever you can. And uh, thanks again. We really, really appreciate it.